Blood! It's everywhere. On children at Halloween, in test tubes at the doctor's office, in the very title of the 2007 drama, There Will Be Blood. And it's even inside you right now. Which means you're part of this story, so buckle up. This is Jordan Clapper Fingers, The Conspiracy. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know a little bit about Pizzagate. And we'll get into that shortly, but this extremely weird idea that pedophiles are using secret symbols is rooted in the belief that elitist cabals, it's always a cabal, are rounding up babies to steal their adrenaline by consuming their blood. There are Republicans in Congress who believe this. You might have also seen it in the Netflix show, The Watcher. It's a conspiracy theory that goes way back before Hillary Clinton and Comet Ping Pong and 2016. It goes back 900 years to when Joe Biden was born. Let's get into it, as Chris Cuomo would say. All right, let's bring in our own little blood cabal. I have two guests today. First, we have Dr. Elise Wong, a professor at California State Fullerton who studies conspiracy narratives going back to medieval England. Elise, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yes, and my next guest is Matt Gertz, a senior fellow at Media Matters for America and extensively covers the relationship between Fox News, Donald Trump, and Trump supporters. Matt, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Guys, you guys ready to talk cabals? So ready. It's always an elite cabal. It's always elite. There's yeah. Well, is there any lower level cabals of just like guys just trying to to get through it who have like a high school education? It's always elite, right? Yes, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point of cabals. <laughs> yes. If you're in a cabal, you have it's to. It's no elite fun to, to be, be in, a in a in a like mediocre cabal. That's the not. state no. school no. of cabals. I mean, yeah. And when it comes whoa, to whoa with the state school thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think this podcast is going to start selling t-shirts that says state school cabal on it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there really is. There's, it, you know, it's always elite cabals and the Illuminati also very elite. You, they need to be more encompassing. We need to have our state school Illuminati and cabals. We'll sell the t-shirts. Go to dailyshow.com, everybody. I um, will wear that at my state school. <laughs> <laughs> Elise, I want to start with you. Let's break down adrenochrome because mm -hmm. it feels like the base for a lot of theories we're going to dive into in this podcast. First of all, is adrenochrome technically real? It is. Actually, that's a good place to start. It is actually a real thing. It's the oxidation of adrenaline, and this can happen naturally in your body or in a lab. It's actually really easy to come by. You can just buy it on the internet. Like, not the dark web internet, just the internet. Um, I think it's something like 25 milligrams for, for 55 bucks, 58 bucks, something like that. I looked it up. Um, so, it's not used for anything, really. There's nothing the FDA has approved it for. It's occasionally used for things like blood clotting. Um, there was some interest in the 1960s for treating, using it to treat schizophrenia, but it really showed no promise, um, so they dropped it. The history of the adrenochrome we're talking about is sort of, it goes back to, I think Aldous Huxley was the first one to talk about it as a drug. He talked about it in Doors of Perception. And then Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is really the one who cemented the myth of adrenochrome as a drug because he turned it into this kind of immortality drug, um, this thing that you have to get from a live source. Um, I think the line is, a corpse is no good, buddy. Um, and so that, and then the, the subsequent movie, they're like dramatized to the effects of adrenochrome. What is this shit? That stuff makes, makes pure, pure mescaline seem like, like ginger, ginger beer, beer, man. Adrenochrome. Adrenochrome? Hmm. <laughs> That's really where our modern perception of it as a drug comes from. So it's from these fictional sources. And are, are we saying it correctly? Adrenochrome? I mean, that's how they say it in the 1998 video. Um, and if you go, I know you're not supposed to. The video, are we talking about the Terry Gilliam film? That's how Johnny yes. Depp pronounces it. Yes, that's this, how this is where this, this, this is where we're getting our information from. Yes, this exactly. Is... Well, that's where they're getting their information from. Like, I know you're not supposed to go to YouTube comments, but if you go to the YouTube comments on this scene, um, they are all about how, how this is real. Yes. Based on Fear and Loathing Las Vegas, which I will yes. say... For me, I love that book. Top 10 book in my world. It's a great book. But that is sort of the, the central, 
the beginning. That and Huxley's book is where the first time we actually hear the term adrenochrome. He even said afterwards that he just wanted a quote unquote crazy drug. And so he made it up. And so he's drawing on Huxley and then like adding his own little stuff. And the adrenochrome, the way it's become, it is, as you were saying, it's it connects to all of the different conspiracy theories because it's a grab bag of the greatest hits, right? It's got pedophilia, it's got satanic rituals, it's got blood rituals, immortality, like satanic panic and Hollywood elites. It's got everything. It's a good one. It is, yeah. Let's add some context to it. In this world, the conspiracy theory is Hollywood liberal elites and Hillary Clinton are murdering children in ritual sacrifices, harvesting the, the chemical compound from human children, drinking their blood to ingest adrenochrome because it has some sort of elixir of life properties. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you're telling <laughs> me it may not be true. I mean, you should you should buy it on the internet and, and find out. It's a, it's at least worth it's at least <laughs> worth a dabble. Uh, Matt, when did you first become aware of Adrenochrome? Uh, I think probably around 2015, 2016, uh, as part of the Pizzagate conspiracy theory. The Pizzagate conspiracy theory posits that this uh, cabal of global elites, uh, who is, you know are are draining uh, this chemical compound from small children and, and sexually abusing them is doing so in the uh, basement of a Washington, D.C. pizza parlor called Comet Ping Pong. Um, this idea spurred in, in some ways from emails from uh, the John Podesta hack uh, during the 2016 uh, election cycle. And uh, I've been to the pizza parlor and it doesn't have a basement that you can use to uh, abuse children and, and take their bodily f fluids. Um, Did you ask? I mean, <laughs> it, it goes one step beyond asking for a bathroom key because they'll happily give you a bathroom key. But you you have to be a little pushy and be like, I need to use the restroom. I also would love access to the basement where the children are tied up and I can get the adrenochrome. Did you ask, Did you probably, specifically ask? I think there probably was a time that you, you could have done that, but uh, as the conspiracy theorists seized on this, uh, the pizza parlor started getting bombarded with uh, phone calls from people who wanted to know more uh, about the, the basement and the uh, you know, Pizzagate conspiracy theory. Uh, and eventually one of the adherents to this conspiracy theory uh, took a gun, uh, went to the pizza parlor looking to save the children, uh, fired it off inside, uh, and was subsequently arrested and spent a couple of years in jail. So, uh, you know, at that point it becomes a, a little bit rude, I think, to, to, to ask the uh, people who work at the pizza parlor. Um, it became a. It had real consequences, and for if 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 this is somewhat new to anybody listening, the Podesta emails get get hacked. WikiLeaks leaks some Podesta emails, and emails between Podesta and Hillary Clinton reference buying cheese pizza, right? I, I don't think it's him and Hillary Clinton, but it's 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 a uh, some sort of email that references pizza that then became a sort of uh, internet meme uh, and brought into the broader conspiracy theory uh, that Elise was talking about. Well, and cheese pizza becomes abbreviated to CP, which also stands for child pornography and Comet Pizza. And so they start to connect those links and Comet Pizza becomes the place to go in a nutshell, right? Yeah, that, that's about it. I, I On the road, it, I somewhat recently talked to somebody who was sort of discussing this um, uh, theory and it is amazing the symbols they see not only in the comet pizza uh, a background and the the symbolism there but I asked them like what do you need to look at they're like well in the pizza chain there's a lot of symbols that you have to stay focused on I was like what do these symbols look like and they're like well they're predominantly circles and triangles there's a huge push for normalizing pedophilia how do they normalize it are they making pedophiles look cool well if you go online there's a whole list of pedophile symbols. Really? Yes. They're they're like circular symbols. There's tri there's a lot of triangles. There's colors. A lot of them are in pizza. Which, if you're at all into purchasing pizza, that <laughs> tends to be all of the symbols you see at any kind of pizza chain. So from their perspective, they're holding a hammer and there's just nails everywhere. 
<laughs> well, I think I think watching Pizzagate happen, and then from my end watching the um, chat rooms and you know message boards and all of these things, both before and afterwards, there's that aspect of it, like the people who really get into the game of it, like let's let's find the the numerology and all of like the special symbols. And then there's the people who are actually mobilized around this. And that's what really struck me about Pizzagate. It was the first time that I really saw this where you could see there was already this, this theory about a pedophile ring being run by the Clintons. And it was kind of a theory in need of specifics. And so they went out seeking specifics and they decided basically randomly that Comet Ping Pong was going to be the place. And then it started this sort of multimedia propaganda campaign where people, they got people to call and harass, as Matt was saying. Um, they got people to flood the, the Yelp reviews and the Google reviews and people to go and harass the proprietor. And then this sort of culminated in the guy who drove up from North Carolina to self-investigate. Um, but that wasn't really the, the story. The story was that then people talked about it that then it was in the national media for like 48 hours, like a whole week. And it was not only in the media, their theory was in the media. And I went back to the message boards afterwards and they were just beside themselves with joy over this. Like it was not, it was not a, it's not at all about, oh, our guy was arrested, whoops, or huh, he didn't really seem to find anything. Um, it was not about that. It was about the media exposure. And then there were sort of further suggestions. Well, how can we get them to keep denying it so they keep saying it so people keep Googling it? And when I was seeing that, I was like, oh, this is something else. This is, this is a kind of savvy media campaign that I think most of us at that point were not totally familiar with. Now we know if you mention something, you have to be very careful what what sort of buzzwords you mention because it will sort of feed the conspiracy theory monster. I'm curious in, in hearing that, what do you think the end goal was? How, how was that a success? Was it, you know, a, a lot of that online culture does, you know, traffic and trolling and the successes of trolling often is large reaction. Is it, is it that that made it the win? Is it the fact that their conversations became mainstream news that was the win? Is there still a connection to the veracity of this theory and that because it's being talked about that that adds some credibility to it? Or is just we like shine and we got some shine? I think it's a lot of we like shine, but I do think that there there was the, the, the jubilation of being able to make the social media to mainstream media jump. And then um, I think it was a huge recruitment tool. I think people hearing the name would then go Google it and then would find their way to these message boards. So I think for them, the coup was really through recruitment. Mm -hmm. Matt, what did you notice, the, the coverage of Pizzagate? You know, when, when did you first remember seeing it and who was, who was first to jump on that? You know, I, I think I, I want to bring in Alex Jones here because mm -hmm. I think he play, has played a, a key role in conspiracy theories uh, for quite some time, but I, I think really made almost a, a sort of mainstream jump during uh, this conspiracy theory. He was one of the uh, major propagators, one of the people with the biggest platforms who would talk about Pizzagate and try to encourage people to look into Pizzagate. You know, we had been following Alex Jones at Media Matters for quite some time, uh, but we always, I, I think as Elise was alluding to, uh, were very hesitant to bring too much direct attention to uh, his conspiracy theories for fear of uh, just sort of bringing more attention to them. And so when we wrote about Alex Jones in 2010, 2011, um, we were largely writing about how other people were giving him uh, their 
uh, support. Fox News uh, personalities who would go on his show, uh, Rand Paul and Ron Paul who would go on his show and, and use uh, the platform of someone who you know is one of the chief popularizers of the idea that 9/11 is an inside job, uh, you know, sort of bringing him into political prominence. Uh, and Pizzagate, I think, was really a a turning point because we saw that someone could use those conspiracy theories, uh, could inflate them, and that there could be a a big real world impact. Uh, when uh, people who uh, came to believe those conspiracy theories went too far. Uh, it was a, a, I think, pretty uh, disturbing uh, time for all of us uh, when, when, when we saw that come together. I mean, as, as somebody both with The Daily Show and having done a TV show after that, you know, parodying the Alex Jones talking points and what was happening in that far right world, that was always a conversation of at what point you don't want to amplify these wild ideas. But at the same time, turning a blind eye to something that's already having an effect on culture, it's already being amplified by legitimate politicians, uh, even the Donald Trump, uh, legitimizing the points of view there. Like y- you, you saw people taking what they would hear from Infowars and the conversation around that, and it was becoming very real world news. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about how some of these things spread. But I, I want to focus one more time on the adrenochrome specifically. Elise, I want to know if if we trace back this specific uh, theory, even the origins of adrenochrome, does it go back before Hunter Thompson? Does it go back before it becomes sort of um, pulp in, in modern culture? Is, is there a history that dates back even, even, even earlier? It definitely does. And the way that it dates back is a little bit of um, sort of associative thinking. Um, So conspiracy theories often work this way. They kind of jump on to things. They have a very lazy logic. They jump onto things that are already um, fully formed. One of the conspiracy theories that is attached to adrenochrome or that adrenochrome is is basically drawing on and modeling itself on is blood libel, which is a conspiracy theory dating back to the Middle Ages that Jewish people Um, drink or use the blood of Christian children for their religious rituals, specifically at Passover. And For the record, we don't do that. Yes. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Thank you, Matt. Thank you for context. Thank thank you for, 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 yeah, specifying that. Um, And it's designed specifically to incite violence. Like, that is what blood libel is for. So there's that kind of thematic connection. But then there's also the fact that the main purveyors of adrenochrome, like... Alex Jones, like Liz Crokin, say that it's blood libel, say that it, it actually dates back to that. And if you look at these adrenochrome memes, one, one sort of popular one that goes around has this very obviously medieval image of a baby being drained of blood with people standing around it. And it says at the top, why does this image even exist? And the image is of Simon of Trent, which is the most famous and well-documented blood libel. And it, it's the this particular blood libel started um, Passover 1475. A father had come to the bishop of Trent and said, my two-year-old son Simon is missing. And this, this bishop already had a story ready to go. Um, he decided it must be the Jewish community, the very small Jewish community in Trent. He had a couple reasons for for wanting this story to be true. One, he felt like the Pope was too soft on the Jewish people and that he was too cozy with them. So this was his little power grab in opposition to the Pope. And then also, if you had a saint, if if he could prove that Simon was martyred by the Jews, um, if you had a saint in your town, that was a huge money-making opportunity. Like you could get people from all around to make pilgrimages to your little altar and then you would make money basically off of like brand um brand building. And so <laughs> it was it, it was like that the brand building che- opportunity. Yeah, it was like there that era's cheesecake factory. If you yeah, had yeah. if you had a cheesecake factory <laughs> in town, you know you're gonna get people from the suburbs who are gonna come in, they're gonna pay some money. It's gonna help the town. That's the thing. And he wanted to kind of put Trent on the map. And so even before they start any kind of trial or anything, they round up the the Jewish community, the entire Jewish community, and imprison them. And he 
hires a physician to write this very inflammatory autopsy that talks less about Simon's body and more about the, I think the phrase is, dry-throated Jews howling for Christian blood, like this really over-the-top kind of autopsy. And then he takes this autopsy. Wait, this, and that was the doctor? That was the, that was that's the doctor. Some, that's, some, that's some really high-end literary anti-Semitism. <laughs> yep. And he, well, it gets more high-end because then he takes this and he sends it around to poets and to artists and is like, make stuff from this. And they do. Like the poets start writing poems about Simon of Trent and the, the woodcutters start making images. And that's the image that shows up in that adrenochrome meme is this sort of propaganda campaign by this Italian bishop who decided he really wanted his own little ritual cult. Those fucking woodcutters. <laughs> they just will take money, whoever puts it out. Where is the artistic integrity in 15th century woodcutters? <laughs> they, they, you know, I, I hold them in such high regard. I love them. I think it's the best century for woodcutters. And yet they are so yeah, willing to turn go. a blind eye to the social responsibility of being a woodcutter in that time. They're taking dirty money to put out anti-Semitic propaganda. Shame. Shame on them. I'm never... <laughs> I'm never buying 15th century woodcutter art again. Shame. Uh. I feel like the parts of this that are really useful, though, is kind of it's kind of that that like it was the propaganda campaign that really made this take off. It wasn't like this was kind of a grassroots rumor that was rooted in sort of general anti-Semitism. I mean, that's why it took off was sort of latching on to generalized anti-Semitism. But the actual formation of the blood libel was very intentionally crafted for a political end by someone who was powerful. I, I have never heard of that. I think it's so easy to to, to look at the um, those in power and also the the religious heresy at the time and the institutions at the time and the point of view they wanted to get out. But the fact that they were using artists to spread that message to affect culture. I mean, you see obvious comparisons to what happens today, but that even yeah. then it was still important. You want this thing to stick, culture needs to stick. And the fact that we're using those images yet today as proof <laughs> of what Hillary Clinton is doing is, is bonkers. Well, I want to take a short ad break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about how adrenochrome spread as an idea even before the internet was even around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jordan Klepper Fingers the Conspiracy. I mean, I never, I didn't actually plan to work on conspiracy theories. Like, I'm a medievalist. I'm like a huge nerd. I like books. And <laughs> this, this was not the way I saw my studies going. But Is it, here what we was are. it? Is it? It just, it just, you basically stumbled on it. And we're like, here we go. Also, is that something was in the ether, <laughs> the modern ether that you saw a connection between the two? Yeah, it was basically in 2015, I started, I mean, like, like all of us, I think I was a little bit concerned and uneasy about the fake news phenomenon. And in particular, this epistemology aspect, this you can't trust anything that you see. Um, and I started hearing echoes with the stuff that I study. And speech patterns, like, that's what they want you to think, do your own research. Um, I've heard or, I, or people are saying these kinds of gestures towards sources. I started seeing those things. And I was like, uh oh, that doesn't that doesn't sound good. That sounds familiar and, and not good. And I just sort of started following that. Um, and now my autocorrect knows adrenochrome. So here we are. <laughs> In the case of these historical conspiracy theories and the beginnings of blood libel, how do you see these theories spread before modern news and communication and memes and 4chan and 8chan and Parler and True Social and should I keep going? I'm not going to keep going. <laughs> well, they spread remarkably well. Um, I think that the the essential shape of blood libel was a very compelling shape. It was, you know, there there are evil forces that are out to get Christian children. And there was also the fact that it was pretty common for medieval children to die in accidents or disappear or fall into a river. Like child death was was quite common. 
And so it became kind of a predictable thing that if a child died in a Christian community, that pretty soon suspicion would fall on the Jewish community. And it did spread by word of mouth, but it also spread by all of these sort of cultural productions. That It spread by these woodcuts. It spread by um, these poems that were written in honor of Simon. And it also spread because these stories got baked into the official histories. These historians think of themselves as, you know, responsible, reliable, um, and they go back to the local histories and they just sort of draw from whatever the local history is. And so these blood libels get baked into sort of accepted history as fact. And then anyone who reads that, will that will be their primary um interaction basically with the Jewish community for a lot of places because these pogroms have already taken place. Magda Tater has done a really great job. She studies blood libel and she's done a really great job of showing how actually before the printing press, word of mouth didn't work that great. It really needed to be written down. And that also shows that it was mostly educated people, mostly higher class people who were spreading blood libel. It wasn't a low class theory. Um, it was a It was a kind of upper class theory. And that's interesting. And I mean, there's a great book by Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, that talks a lot about how the mediums affect the message. The adventure of the printing press affected not only mm-hmm. the way information was spread, but the way we think about information, yes. uh, the way we process information. And then you suddenly have television come mm-hmm. out, and now it's the way in which we communicate and the way we process information is very different than the way we used to with the printing press. I think it's fascinating to think of that in terms of like who is spreading information and that it was a <laughs> it was an elitist thing. You had to be able to uh, speak that language then. But now that we see information changing, the technology changing, Matt, I want to bring you in here. How are you seeing conspiracy theories like Pizzagate uh, and other Q theories spread given the new technology that we have well the the core benefit that social media companies will say that they provide to their uh, customers and that uh internet companies say they provide to their customers is the idea of bringing the world together giving people an opportunity to find uh, communities to communicate with people across the globe and to, to sort of find a common purpose together and i mean there's a dark side to that it also has made it much much easier to find a community of conspiracy theorists to share your ideas about the uh, you know dark hidden uh, messages in the world's uh, events uh, to uh, share your views about the Illuminati or whoever else is manipulating uh, what's going on around you uh, and that's just a, an incredibly powerful force the barrier to entry for producing one of these conspiracy theories is much lower you don't you don't you know um, the JFK conspiracy theories, uh, you know, you had to like write letters to people um, later on as uh, Xeroxes and what uh, faxes and so on and so forth. Um, it's just it very shows easy you now. Just how lazy conspiracy theorists are now. Can you imagine if you had to write letters to spread just some BS you read on Twitter? You're like, oh, I want to put that out. Elon Musk, he would not be pushing conspiracy theories if he had to write a letter to get that thing going. Do you also look at places like Fox? Like, what, you know, we, we look at what's happening with social media, but more of the mainstream media outlets. How are you seeing that affect this conversa- conversation, specifically with something like Pizzagate? Sure. So, I mean, the reality is that we live in a bifurcated news environment. There is one set of uh, sources of information that uh, is generally uh, used by people in the left, on the center, just sort of mainstream news outlets, uh, and then you have this entirely separate uh, realm of right-wing media outlets um, that uh, speak very uh, clearly and directly to a right-wing audience. Um, you know, the the way we see conspiracy theories moving these days is they'll start at this sort of, you know, message board and social media platform level with a sort of army of individuals who are, are coming up with their own uh, spin on what's happening on a particular event. Um, it will spread from there through a network of hyper-partisan news sites, uh, places like Gateway Pundit, uh, that do not have 
standards of any sort, uh, that are not interested in the basic rules of journalism, but that want to uh, have political impact and, and make money off of advertising. Um, and, and from there, you can see them sort of uh, we get woven into the broader debate. You know, the reality is that the right-wing media figures uh, at the sort of higher level, your Fox News is, uh, are not interested in batting down those sorts of conspiracies. They're not interested in challenging uh, their audiences and telling them that what they might have heard is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Instead, you'll see either uh, them ignoring it altogether or providing a sort of wink and a nod uh, at the conspiracy theory or uh, telling their viewers that it's okay, more or less, that like the, there are reasons to be skeptical of things that are happening around you, that uh, the elites want to keep you from talking about uh, QAnon or what have you, um, and that... Uh, you know, whether or not that's true, it's not a danger the way, uh, you know, other other people will tell you. I mean, if this is an issue with right-wing media, they have this weird rhetoric that is politicizing children in the name of protecting them. Anything from disturbing conspiracy theories to don't say gay bills, anti-trans bills, etc. Do you see a connection there? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these uh, conspiracy theories get rolled up together. There was a big push over the last year and a half or, uh, or so on the right, you know, throughout the entire ecosystem to talk about uh, the idea of groomers, of... Uh, save you know, the children. Save the children, absolutely. Uh, basically, that, that uh, teachers are trying to turn your kids gay, turn your kids trans, in possibly molest them, and it all kind of gets wound up together. There aren't really firm barriers to a lot of these conspiracy theories. Uh, people who start to believe one of them uh, tend to start adopting uh, others as well. Elise, uh, historically, has there ever been a way to get people to stop believing conspiracy theories? <laughs> I mean, it's a complicated question, right? It, it depends on who you're talking about. Like, I don't Johannes Hinderbach, the, the bishop of Trent, I don't know that he actually believed that Simon was killed by the Jews. That was, that was sort of beside the point. I think he believed that Jewish people are evil and he wanted to drive them out. And this was a convenient way to do it, plus a bunch of other political benefits. I don't know that he actually believed it. Um, so if you're talking about these sort of cynical purveyors of it who use it for radicalization and use it for their own sort of economic and political gain, um, I think you just have to take away the gain and then like that will that will kind of kill it. For everybody else, I think it is a complicated question because the thing about conspiracy theories is they're not about the details, they're not about the story, they're I mean, I feel like your segments, Jordan, have really shown this well. As soon as you ask them a question, like that's the end. <laughs> like there's, it doesn't go anywhere. You can't actually have a conversation about conspiracy theories. I don't even think that conspiracy theorists could have a conversation with each other about it because it's fundamentally not discursive. It's not something you can have a discussion about. It is just an attempt to make this sort of core story about yourself match up with the world. And every conspiracy theory has this same core story and that's why it's so powerful. Um, it's, it's the story that the theorist holds on to and then sort of tries to match up with the world in a kind of messy way. And the story is basically, once upon a time, we were happy and everything was good and we were in charge and we were safe. And then the monsters took hold, but no one knew that they had. And these monsters are not of the sort of vaguely threatening variety. They have to be absolutely gigantic, demonic, sort of the, the most hyperbolic thing you can think of, go another step. So it's always children, Satan, um, mutilation and torture, pedophilia. And the story goes that everything seemed fine because the monsters made sure this was all kept secret. So the monsters control what you know. And only the heroes of the story knew the truth, and then they arrived to save the world. And that's the benefit that you get from it. You get that worldview about yourself, that you are a continuously just sort of horrifically embattled 
hero of the story. And you can't really give up on this self, like this self image of embattled heroism. It's, it's very difficult to give up on. Um, it's not just the high of thinking of yourself as a hero. It's also that you convince yourself that you are in this battle of absolute good and absolute evil. And so then you get to issues of like, if you ask about democracy or fair play, what are you nuts? Like this is about, this is about the end of the world. So it, it makes it impossible to sort of dial back to um, issues of fairness or accuracy. It's actually not about that. And I feel like you can kind of hear that when you're talking to these QAnon followers, when they try to answer your questions, they aren't actually trying to, to say, like you say, so what did actually happen in January 6th? They'll say FBI, CIA, Clinton, just sort of a grab bag. But what they're actually trying to tell you is this story that the monsters are out to get us and I'm trying to save us. There's kind of no other point to it. That's, that's the whole ballgame. And when the monsters, when there's a partisan overlay on that, when the mm -hmm. monsters are one party and the people who are trying to save you are, are Donald Trump, I mean, there's no room for debate at that point, right? Like, yeah. there's no room to talk about uh, it's important to respect uh, e electoral defeats, right? Because if the people who you are uh, losing elections to are uh, monsters who are abusing children, then mm -hmm. you have a moral responsibility to go try to subvert those election results. And the resistance is kind of like baked into the story because the story is that the monsters came and took over and they kept it, they covered it up. They kept everybody from knowing. So any information that you get in from the outside is suspect, even, even information that you might get from sympathetic sources. So the only thing then you're left with is kind of like, going with your gut and what feels true. It feels true that I am a victim and it feels true that I'm the hero of the story. And so let's just go with that. So you're telling me I shouldn't read this story to my son every night before going to bed. <laughs> he loves it. It's, it's, the, it's a dark Eric Carl story, but I, I like it so much better than that hungry caterpillar. <laughs> you, might be, you might be unhappy with the results. <laughs> <laughs> of raising this, your child this way. <laughs> I tell you, all of his peers are reading it. They seem to really be into it. That hero's journey. Uh, <laughs> um, after the break, we're going to talk about how the adrenochrome conspiracy theory is related to the attack at Nancy Pelosi's house. It seriously is. This is Jordan Klepper, Fingers the Conspiracy. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jordan Clapper Fingers the Conspiracy. I'm here with Dr. Elise Wong and Matt Gertz, two experts who follow conspiracy theories. And we're talking about adrenochrome. How Democrats are drinking babies' blood, allegedly, allegedly, and what that means for American politics. Now, recently, Nancy Pelosi's house was broken into by a right-wing conspiracy theorist. He was looking for Pelosi and ended up attacking her husband with a hammer. But Matt, you've written about how the conspiracy theories this attacker specifically believed and how he was radicalized in the ecosystem of right-wing misinformation. How does this all connect? Well, the uh, alleged assailant uh, had a substantial internet uh, paper trail. Uh, he had a, a couple of blogs, various other uh, social media platforms, and what he posted on those uh, sites was very much the kind of textbook uh, online right-wing conspiracy theory radicalization pattern uh, that we've been seeing for years now. Uh, his uh, social media and blogs are, are filled with references to QAnon, uh, to Adrenochrome, uh, to Pizzagate, to Gamergate, uh, as well as a sort of uh, grab bag of uh, bigotries uh, related to black people and uh, women and Jews uh, and uh, gay people and trans people. Um, it's a grab bag. Yeah, of no, the it's, worst it's 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 the it's, it's, it's the it's the greatest hits. Honestly, I spent some time uh, looking through these websites on Friday, and I was like, oh, it's just it's it's all of it. From there, and this happened very very quickly. Uh, you did not see uh, people on the right saying, oh my god, uh, the uh, things that people on the right are saying are, are uh, leading to political violence. 
Uh, instead, a, a story about uh, political vi violence uh, committed by someone who believed right-wing conspiracy theories about uh, how uh, Democrats are, are depraved, uh, it was turned into another right-wing conspiracy theory about how Democrats are depraved. Uh, the story that developed over the following hours was that uh, the assailant had not broken into the House, uh, but in fact he had been invited in by Paul Pelosi because they were gay lovers, uh, and that the violent uh, attack on Pelosi was in fact some sort of gay lovers spat. That's what they came up with, and that spread remarkably quickly, as, as it tends to do through this right-wing uh, information ecosystem, uh, until you had Elon Musk uh, tweeting out a link to a uh, sort of hyper-partisan fake news website uh, on Sunday morning. So it was, you know, 72 hours, uh, 48 hours uh, from the uh, assault becoming uh, known to the conspiracy theory reaching the wealthiest man on earth. At least something like this pops up. Is this how you imagine it playing out this quickly and evolving or devolving in this similar manner? Unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I do think the speed is different from sort of the history that I study but the manner in which things spread is really not. And if, I think a few things are key that the platform matters. It, de it depends on who is picking this up and who is who is running with it. And then there's also a durability to conspiracy theories that because they have this sort of epistemological challenge built into them, by that, by that I mean they, ch they challenge how you know what you know. And they say these things that you think you know, you don't know but it doesn't replace it with anything. So it's just sort of epistemic destabilization. So you just don't have anything to stand on. And that creates an environment in which conspiracy theories really thrive because once you, it, once you can't trust anything, then the only thing you can trust is your own sense of the story that you like or the one that sounds good to you. This was definitely true in sort of the medieval and early modern period of blood libel. There were often people who have, powerful people who opposed blood libel. For Simon of Trent, the reason why we have so many documents on it is the Pope tried to intervene in this. He tried to put a stop to it. And then, then the very first blood libel in um, the 12th century, this was a boy named William of Norwich. The Norwich sheriff actually got involved and protected the Jewish community. So there's always been pushback um, from kind of mainstream sources and yet these conspiracy theories just thrive if there's already a kind of destabilized trust in the regular sources of knowledge. So I think I think the the modern speed, that is new, um, how quickly that happens. But you would have a blood libel come out and the next week, all of the Jews in town would be arrested and tortured. And it it was pretty fast. It happened pretty fast. Well, we mentioned the platform here, and Matt, you brought up Elon Musk and the tweet that he had adding to this confusion. He referenced a website that claimed Hillary Clinton died in 2016 and was replaced with a clone. So what does this say now in this new era of Elon's Twitter? What is that going to do to these conversations? I mean, I think it's going to continue to accelerate them. I, I think there has been... Uh, some effort by uh, the uh, social media platforms some of the time to try to rein in the most extreme and dangerous forms of misinformation. It's been haphazard, it's been imperfect, but Elon Musk's Twitter is going to do is kind of toss that aside. Uh, he himself is quite obviously a bit of a conspiracy theorist, uh, someone who uh, has, uh, you know, accused people of being uh, pedos. Uh, that That's just sort of uh, sort of his wheelhouse, so to speak. Uh, and it's it's difficult to imagine Twitter being interested in uh, throttling conspiracy theories that its own owner is spreading. Um, that's just not going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that platform is going to become less stable. It's going to become a, a less valuable source for credible information because of that. Elise, I'm curious... Can you talk about the progression of belief into 
action? Like, what takes somebody from Pizzagate to an actual act of political violence in 2022? I mean, this is what scholars of radicalization study, right? How do you how do you come from an idea into actual action? Um, radicalization online is part of the story. It's not the whole story, but it certainly um, directs your any sort of anger or dissatisfaction you already have. It validates it and it amps it up and it focuses it on a target. Um, so it's a little bit like pointing a loaded gun at um, a specific target. And can I go back to the Elon thing for just a sec? Yes, please. Um, the the whole verification thing really struck me because I think, you know, it's clear the, the money of it doesn't actually matter. Like he's like $20, $8, whatever to sell sell verification, right? That's his new thing. He's going to sell verification on Twitter. What really struck me is that this is not an attempt to get the money. It's an attempt to devalue verification in general because verification is meant to show you which sources are trustworthy, right? It was meant to sort of identify members of the media and corporations and so that you knew that it was actually coming from that source and you knew that you could trust it. It was not a sort of celebrity thing originally. That was that was not the purpose of verification. And by turning it into something that you can buy, it just completely devalues verification and it gets rid of that layer of validation so that you you know what you can trust which sources you can trust it, it gets rid of that sort of you know it's it's destabilizing the the way we know what we know and that seems to me to be the point of the whole verification thing in fact because musk is so polarizing we mm-hmm. could see a situation where uh his supporters who are largely on the right are much more willing to actually shell out the money mm-hmm. uh than uh you know, more credible uh, mainstream journalists are, um, those less credible sources will uh, get sort of algorithmically accelerated more than everybody else and uh, become a, a bigger part of the conversation. I'm curious what advice you would have to consumers, specifically of Twitter. I think a lot of people are looking at this. They see these issues, see the problem, uh, and are asking themselves the question, do I divorce myself from this platform? I don't know if the answer is to step away from it and and not be a part of the conversation or understand the conversation, but are you complicit in what is becoming a less and less trustworthy place? So I think part of the issue here is I don't really view it as a place for conversation. Um, I mean, I... I, I Tweet use at me, Twitter. Matt. I got a lot of no, interesting things to say. I, Come at me. We'll go back and forth. It's fun. We'll be playful. I got some gifts I'll send your way. It's a really fun chat. The way I use Twitter, I use it as a, a broadcast medium, right? It's a way for me to get my views and my work out into the public. It's a way for me to hear views from uh, people who might have interesting ideas or thoughts um, but I, I don't do that much interaction with it because I think it's a, a actually a really bad medium for having uh, debates of any kind. If I want to have a, a conversation with someone, I will try to follow up with them and, and start an email conversation or phone or what have you. It's, it's hard to have a, a substantive discussion with the rest of the world uh, trying to involve itself in that. I will use Twitter less if that becomes less feasible. If I think that uh, my uh, tweets aren't getting read, or if I think that I am not able to easily find credible information uh, that I want to be reading, um, that's when the value proposition will fall to basically nothing. I feel like this is where our disciplines come into play because you're in media, I'm in medieval studies. So I have a very... <laughs> my, my following... What you will be shocked to hear <laughs> is tiny. <laughs> um, I'm also I'm also locked, so I I really just use it for conversation. Like I really just use it to connect with other other people in my field or who study the same things that I do. And I think one of the really one of the reasons a lot of people are mourning this is it has been an incredible tool for people to connect. Um, within their own tiny little subfield. Like, 
I feel more connected to other medievalists of color on Twitter because we have kind of created our own little ecosystem than anywhere else. And I wouldn't get that anywhere else. I would miss it for that. And obviously, if again, if like you said, if, if that becomes impossible, then then like I'm not going to use it anymore. But I also think this whole question of so do you stay? Do you go? Do you pay the $8, $20, whatever it ends up being? I feel like it, that's a very American question. Like, how can we make this the individual responsibility to decide what to do? Um, this is the, the robber baron has screwed up the system and now we are responsible for fixing it. And, you know, my recycling or not recycling my water bottle is really what's leading to climate change. Like, that's that's really that's really the thing, um, the sort of individual responsibility for these things. And I think that's kind of what gets us into trouble with conspiracy theories to begin with, right? Do your own research. Find out for yourself. The thing is, with huge platforms and huge areas of knowledge, you just can't do it yourself. I mean, as we all discovered in the pandemic when we all became amateur epidemiologists, right? <laughs> We're not very good at this. I don't remember high school <laughs> biology very well. I'm not not going to be good at making choices, personal choices about my own level of risk and my kids' level of risk. And, you know, I am not a good person to put that decision on. And that's kind of how we've offloaded it. And so I feel like that's maybe not, I know that it's sort of going to be personally difficult for a lot of people to figure out what to do about Twitter. Um, but I don't really feel like that's that's where the change comes from. Um, I, w I want to wrap this up kind of looking specifically at what happened with uh, Nancy Pelosi's husband and what we've sort of been discussing here, but sort of to zoom out as well. How do politicians like Nancy Pelosi try and convince people that they don't partake in ritual children sacrifices? Was at a rally weeks ago, and a man was convinced that Nancy Pelosi is a vampire and drinks children's blood. He was convinced. I followed up and I asked, you said literally. Did you mean literally? He said literally. You see Republicans on one side and... The devil on the other. Are yeah. we talking metaphorical devil, like, oh, they do bad stuff? No, literally, you know, vampires drinking blood. I don't want to nitpick here, but... Vampires tend to be eternally youthful, and I look at Nancy Pelosi, and she's a lot of things, but I guess I don't think vampire. Somebody in her party definitely drinks blood. How does someone like that attempt to knock down this issue? And, and with those difficulties, what does that say about where we're at politically if we struggle to even do that? Matt? I don't know, honestly. I mean, it's very difficult to... Uh, reach someone who believes that you uh, drink the blood of children. Um, the, the uh, you know, I, I think that it's just a hard problem. And so we end up talking around it, right? We end up talking about what are the ways that policy can uh, weaken the structures that are in place that uh, allow these conspiracy theories to flourish. Um, because as Elise says, it, the, these conspiracy theories have always been with us, but it has become easier uh, for uh, them to propagate and easier for people to come to accept them. And I think that's really uh, the, the available channel. Mm -hmm. Elise? Is there, is, is there any advice you have for Nancy Pelosi or anybody else who looks at this, is pulling out their hair, just attempting to, to, to try to knock down what seems like to be the inconceivable? I mean, I think there's sort of the, the media answer and then there's the personal answer about a approaching this person personally. Um, so the media answer, like I don't, I'm not a media expert. And so I wouldn't know exactly how to do this. But I think that platforms really are the key, the platforms that we give people to propagate these ideas. Um, I think that, you know, when Alex Jones got involved, 
things really took off. And when Alex Jones was taken off of Twitter and, and sort of deplatformed from a bunch of places, his his influence really did die down for a little while. Like it actually had an influence. And I think deplatforming and treating social media as the sort of communities that they are and the news sites that they are and having even stricter standards for them than we do for sort of in-person conduct, I think is is not going to happen. But that would be my suggestion for, for the media side of things. I think you have to control the, the amplification of these conspiracy theories. And, and there's also just sort of the larger problem of society-wide radicalization. And um, that is a, that's a bigger question than just conspiracy theories. The only people who can really get to, people who are deep into it, are those who are already intimate with these people, who are already friends with these people, who already have some other form of connection with them. You're not going to get through to them. That's not... Sorry. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> I know. It's I on know. you, family. You we, family yeah. out there. Talk to those you love. I mean, you also speak yeah. to to something there. There's the intimate relationship people have with their computers when they're alone in their room, mm-hmm. and that person, yeah. and that interesting video. It's like a parasocial relationship. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I see going to these rallies, this myth of American exceptionalism. We talk with such rhetoric of everybody on their own hero's journey, and I will say mm-hmm. a lot of those MAGA rallies. You talk about all the problems in the world, and then somebody gets on stage and they says, "You're a patriot. You can be a hero. You can do this." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, guys, uh, this has been lovely. Uh, Elise Wong, Matt Gertz, uh, I leave this conversation energized as if I've supped on the blood of a child. <laughs> Thank you. That's all I could ask for. Um, I appreciate your insight and your thoughts. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Listen to Jordan Klepper Fingers, The Conspiracy from The Daily Show on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts.